Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, and a couple of months ago I made a series of videos discussing the importance of crop factor, what it's used for, and the idea that you should apply the crop factor not only to the focal length, but also to the aperture. And some people, most people got this, about 95% of people liked it and understood what was going on, but about 5% of people struggled with one aspect of it or another. And I did address some of those responses, but one of the people who disagreed with different parts of it was Joe Jackson. And Joe Jackson was kind enough to record a video discussing his ideas. So I wanted to go with his permission, take different parts of his video, play them back, and then provide some information that wasn't in the previous videos, a lot of new information and new research to support the ideas that I've had. And there is a lot of new discovery. So we'll start with just an introduction from Joe, just to show that we're all friends and everybody's polite. Now, this is not nothing really against Tony. He seems like a really great guy. Uh, he got a wonderful channel. But he had some misleading information that I want to correct, and hopefully he will listen to this. Thanks, Joe. And I want to say I do listen. And in fact, we've set up a form that people can use to submit detailed information about mistakes that we make. And in the past, we've released several different videos where we've corrected mistakes that we made. We were, I know much of the world takes a stance on something and never, ever changes, but we are scientists here and we listen to new information and we correct when we do make mistakes because we're not batting a thousand in life. Anyway, that's the location of the form. And in particular, I want to submit a challenge to everybody who disagrees with this. Use this form and create a, an experiment that I can perform. Name whatever gear you think will make your experiment uh, prove us wrong and show me that it's more accurate to describe a lens by applying the crop factor to the focal length but not the aperture. Show me that the results, the final pictures you get with that lens are better described with the crop factor applied to the focal length but not applied to the aperture. Let's go on and play clip number two from Joe. He made the comment going from a full frame camera, you know, lens, and putting that on a smaller sensor camera lens, like uh, going from a 6D to perhaps like a, a 7D, the uh, camera actually let in less light. And this is actually not true. Going from this lens to a crop sensor you know, camera from full frame to crop, there is no change in light. This lens lets in the same amount of light regardless. Lens remains the same, it lets in the same amount of light. It doesn't use, use as much light as this lens is letting in. I totally agree with all of that. Joe is completely correct, and in fact, I never said anything that contradicted that. This is one of the most common problems that I had with this, is people kind of assumed that I thought various things that were completely wrong and then got mad at me about it, and I wrote back and I would be like, oh, you and I completely agree, and if you think I think that the lens physically changes, of course not, of course I don't think that. The crop factor is an abstract concept used for comparing the final results that you get with a, a given lens, uh, focal length and aperture on different size sensors. Obviously it doesn't physically transform the lens to attach a lens to a camera with a different size sensor. I will say Joe pointed out that the lens gathers the same light no matter what, and he's absolutely right. It's, he also said that the sensor gathers a smaller portion of that light, and that's also right, and that is kind of the point I'm making. So because the, sense, the sensor is gathering a smaller portion of the light, we see increased levels of noise in smaller sensors, and we also see uh, reduced depth of field as well as a uh, different focal length. And by applying the crop factor to both the focal length and the aperture, and the square of the crop factor to the ISO, you can uh, very accurately predict the performance of different lenses. Here's an illustration showing how crop factor works. Uh, the largest box here is a full frame sensor, and then we see different size sensors overlaid on it. In the center, we see the smallest type of sensor. So if you were to use a single focal length lens and switch the bodies out, you would get very different pictures. And so it gets to be very confusing. This was taken with a 500 millimeter lens. And you can see that somebody with a CX sized sensor would get a very different picture than somebody with a full frame sensor. And so it's very confusing to go to people and say, you should use a 500 millimeter lens because it means something very different to people depending on the camera that they have and the sensor size. So the idea of crop factor means that somebody just needs to learn what the crop factor of their particular camera is, and then they can use that and either multiply it or divide it by the desired uh, effective focal length to figure out the lens that they need to get. It's a convenient way to understand what your final picture will look like because focal length and f-stop are both, both based on physical 
traits of the lens that do not have a direct relationship to the final image that you get unless you also factor in the sensor size. You always have to factor in the sensor size. So this is the formula. Take your full frame focal length and divide it by the crop factor. So if you have a 1.5x camera, an APS-C camera, and you want to be at 200 millimeters because you saw a picture that you like at 200 millimeters, you would take 200 and divide it by 1.5, and that would be the focal length that you'd want to shoot at. Here's an example, 100 millimeters on two different cameras, a full frame camera and a micro four thirds camera, which has a 2x crop factor. As you can see, even though it's the same number, you get very different results. And if you were trying to get that picture on the left, and you got the picture on the right, you'd be upset. <laughs> so we use this so we can, can predict how a lens is going to behave for planning purposes, but also mostly for purchasing purposes. So we can buy a lens that does what we want it to. When you apply the crop factor, you'll see that with a 2x crop factor, you would need a 200 millimeter lens to get the same results as a 100 millimeter lens on micro four thirds. And so when we apply that, when we predict how the lens is going to behave, we see that the two pictures do look much more similar. So to reiterate, crop factor does not physically change a lens, of course. It also does not change your camera settings because your camera settings are about exposure. They kind of determine the brightness of a picture. But the camera settings don't determine uh, the depth of field, uh, the actual angle of view that you're going to get, and they also don't determine the amount of noise that's going to be in your image. It's just about the brightness of the picture. So let's play clip number three from Joe. If you go into a crop sensor camera, the crop sensor cameras do, you know, don't utilize as light as good, you know, as a full frame. But this has a lot to do with surface area and the size of the pixels on the pixel density of that sensor. Crop sensor cameras don't handle light as good as full frames. This is cause of pixel density. Basically, if you got 20,000 or 20 million pixels into an area about like this, or vessels area about like this, you know, just gradually, just a little bit smaller. Less light is able to get into those pixels because they're smaller, so you get less photons hitting the pixels. Thus, overall, you get less pix photons hitting the sensor, which means you get less ISO performance. Thanks, Joe, and he raises a really common question. What's the relationship between pixel density and noise? Let's look at a chart. On the left side of the chart here, we see uh, the, the vertical graph is sensor scores as taken from DxO mark. So higher scores here mean less noise, cleaner images. Lower scores mean more noise. Running horizontally towards the left, we see cameras with a low pixel density, such as the Sony a7S, which is full frame and has only 12 megapixels. On the right, we see cameras with a high pixel density, such as the Nikon D810, which is full frame but has 36 megapixels. More pixels crammed into the same space means they're a little more dense. These are all, every single 2014 camera as taken from the DxO Mark database. Thanks, DxO Mark, for doing such a great job uh, with your objective testing of sensors. Looking at the line, because it's diagonal, we see that cameras with a low pixel density have low total image noise. Cameras with a high pixel density have high noise. But sometimes correlating data like that can be tricky because it's possible that there's a secondary condition, that this is not a causal relationship but there's something else influencing it. This chart shows the relationship of sensor size and pixel density. I've replaced the vertical graph here with sensor size. So as we go higher up on the vertical axis, we see the bigger sensors, full frame sensors, and towards the bottom we see APS-C and micro four thirds sensors. So this says something we all kind of know, right? There is a relationship between sensor size and pixel density. Smaller sensors, they still have 24 megapixels or 16 megapixels. They're just crammed into a smaller space, so obviously, there's a greater pixel density there. And so we know there's a relationship between sensor size and pixel density. So let's factor out sensor size. And the way I'm going to do that is by multiplying the ISO score by um, the square millimeters of a given sensor so that all sensors are effectively the same size. In other words, if a micro four third sensor is one quarter the size of a full frame sensor, then I'll take its score and multiply it by four. It's not an exact number, but I use the exact numbers in my math. And as we chart that once again, we don't see a diagonal line anymore. In other words, there doesn't seem to be a correlation between the relative ISO, once you factor out the sensor size, and pixel density. In other words, small sensors seem to score the same per square millimeter for the amount of light that they're gathering at a given ISO. Keep in mind that ISO is 
a measurement of the amount of light falling per square millimeter on a sensor. It is not a measurement of the total amount of light. So what I've done is make these equal according to the total amount of light that a sensor could gather. Keeping, in other words, here a micro four thirds sensor is gathering the same total amount of light as a full frame sensor. And what we see are very similar ISO scores. So I do not think there is a relationship between ISO scores and pixel density once you factor out sensor size, once you keep the total amount of light constant. So does, sensor, does pixel density impact noise? No. Does sensor size impact noise? Let's look at a different graph. And this is a graph of every camera that DxO Mark has ever tested, starting in 2001 and moving up through the end of 2014. At the top here in yellow, we see full frame cameras. And then in gray, we see APS-C cameras. And in blue, we see micro four thirds cameras. And the layers seem really distinct. I'll draw on some trending lines here, and it becomes even more visually distinct. But over time, full frame sensors have always scored better than APS-C sensors, and micro four thirds sensors at the bottom have always scored worse at any given year. So over time, the new micro four thirds sensors are actually scoring better than old APS-C cameras. And some of the new APS-C cameras are starting to catch up with full frame cameras back from, say, 2004. But over time, the sensor technology seems to have kind of stayed, at, stayed in place. Nobody has, uh, no micro four thirds camera has ever leapt up to the quality of a full frame camera. So does sensor size impact noise? Yes. But once again, we can work with relative ISO. It's interesting to keep the total light gathered by different sensors equal. Because as I said, ISO is relative to the size of the sensor. So let's give those small sensors the exact same amount of light as the big sensors and see how they score. In this chart, we no longer see layers. Now we see those full frame sensors and the APS-C sensors and the micro four thirds sensors all mixed up over time. There's some full frame sensors down lower and some APS-C sensors up higher, but everything is blended together. So to me, because we see no particular correlation once we remove sensor size, the biggest difference here is sensor size, but not really. It's more the total amount of light that the camera is allowed to gather. Just to refresh your mind, this is what they look like when we didn't factor out the total amount of light, because here, the micro four thirds sensors are not getting as much light at a given ISO, because again, ISO is relative to the size of the sensor. This is when they actually get the same total amount of light. So does total light impact noise? The answer is definitely yes. In fact, when we factor out total light, you can't really see any difference between these sensors. It seems to all be about total light. So let's play one more clip from Joe. This is why you get a camera like a full frame that shoot ISO 6400 and you're like, wow, this picture still looks great. But if you get a crop sensor camera and you're shooting like uh, ISO 800, that's about maybe ISO 1600, about as good as you can get. So Joe's doing something that a lot of people do and that's trying to understand how, what kind of sort of results you can get with smaller sensors and at what point you'll actually be creating comparable results to full frame sensors. Like, what ISOs do you have to shoot at with the smaller sensors to get decent results? And like most people, Joe just kind of drew at straws. He picked a couple of different ISOs. He thought it was ISO 1600, but he wasn't sure. Well, I created some algorithms that make this very, very easy for you to, to predict. And um, it's basically this. It's the full frame ISO score divided by your crop factor squared. Now that's not quite precise. There are a couple of reasons for this. One is that micro four thirds sensors have a different aspect ratio. They're a little more square and a little less elongated than a full frame sensor. So to be more precise about it, these are the ISO crop factors that you will have to apply in order to predict the amount of noise in a camera uh, when compared to full frame cameras from the same generation. Now I say the same generation because sensor technology obviously makes a difference. But I think most people overestimate the differences in the sensor technologies, and we have some data to back that up too. So in other words, if you have a micro four thirds camera, it's commonly accepted that it uses a 2x crop factor. And if you were to square that, you would be dividing the full frame ISO by four. But it's actually 
because the Micro Four Thirds sensor it's not quite as long, it's a little more square, so it uses that space a little more efficiently. Here are three different pictures taken with cameras at uh, with, with different sized sensors and using the same ISO. And you can see on the left the full frame camera with the 1x crop factor is definitely cleaner than the 1.6x camera and the 2x Micro Four Thirds sensor definitely has the most noise. That's because we're shooting at the same ISO. Because that full frame sensor is bigger, it's gathering more total light. So let's adjust these. Let's let that Micro Four Thirds sensor gather the same amount of light as the full frame sensor. And now when you look at those, you, they have different light patterns. But for the most part, they look very, very similar. So these are the differences when you keep the total light different. And this is what it looks like when you have the same total light. So again, I think this supports my theory that the amount of noise in total noise in an image is based on the total light that that sensor gets. So let's ask the question, does technology impact noise? Because so many people say, yes, Micro Four Thirds sensors gather less light, but they have superior technology, therefore they can give me similar results to an APS-C camera. Well, fortunately, again, thanks to DxO Mark, we don't have to take guesses or suppose about the importance of sensor technology. We can look at actual data and know exactly what sort of pictures we're going to be able to get. Um, so this is the amount of uh, the ISO scores that you would get based on the crop, ISO crop factors that I gave earlier. This is if you're guessing uh, full frame camera at ISO 6400 will produce similar results to a 1.5x APS-C camera at ISO 2723 or Canon APS-C camera at ISO 2461. I think Joe guessed that at ISO 800 on a crop lens, you'd get about the same noise as ISO 6400 on a full frame camera. And we can find out by looking at these numbers that it's actually much, much better than that. You can go all the way up to ISO. If you're happy with ISO 6400 on a full frame camera, you can shoot at ISO 2500 or so on an APS-C camera or ISO 1600 on a micro four thirds camera. So it takes out the guesswork, right? Let's look at actual data gathered from DxOMark to see just how different cameras are relative to the sensor size. So again, we're keeping the total light constant, assuming that you give those micro four thirds sensors about four times more light, 3.8 times more light. This is what you see. You can see over here on the right, the A7S and the D4S are doing about 0.3 stops better than the average. On the left, the old, uh, Canon 1200D, which is the uh, T5, is doing almost two-thirds of a stop worse than the average. That's interesting because that Canon has not updated the sensor. So these are all 2014 cameras, but the T5 has a really, really old sensor. Canon didn't update it, and that's why it's doing so poorly. So in this particular scenario, the very best sensor, the Sony A7S, was about one stop better than the worst sensor. And I looked at this data over time since the beginning of digital cameras, and that stays about true. So you hear in forums all the time people saying that this camera is about two stops better than this camera. Comparing the very best and one of the most expensive cameras to the very worst and cheapest camera is only about a one stop difference given cameras released in the same year. So does technology impact noise? We can say technology impacts noise by about one stop at most. But there were some, that last comparison was kind of extreme. It's kind of extreme to compare like a $350 Canon T5 that hasn't been updated in five years to the brand new A7S, which is kind of a low light marvel. So let's compare more comparable common cameras in more of a similar price range. And this is what we see. Now make sure you look at that vertical axis on the left there because that stops relative to average. You can see all of these are less than one tenth of a stop different relative to the average. You can see the D750 uh, scores actually a little bit better than the D810 when they gather the same amount of light. The 7D Mark II is just a hair worse than the D810. The D3300 actually per square millimeter really doing the best but the, the entire difference here from the best and the worst of this chart is only 0.15 stops. So People badmouth the 7D Mark II because it's not as good as, say, a D750, um, and that's true. But if you keep the sensor sizes the same, if you keep the total light gathered the same, suddenly the differences kind of disappear. 
And it's just something you can factor into your photography. You could use a lens with a faster aperture, therefore allowing you to use a lower ISO and gather the same total amount of light as a full frame camera. So we can see, looking at comparable common cameras, the 7D Mark II is among the worst there, and Canon sensors have indeed been far worse than the competitors for a long time. But now it's within a tenth of a stop of the D810 if you give them the same amount of light. And that is important when you talk theoretically about the performance of different camera manufacturers and how far behind Canon is in their sensor technologies. The best sensors per square millimeter are the GH4, the Alpha 6000, the Alpha 5100, and the D3300. But indeed, almost every difference between these sensors correlates to their size. It's almost all about size. We can see within a given year, the difference is only about 0.15 stops. Everything else relates to size and the total amount of light that a sensor can gather at a given ISO. So what this is telling us is that technology doesn't matter a lot. It's the total light that a sensor can gather. And that's important because what this means is that full frame cameras will probably always be better at a given ISO. Smaller sensors will always be a bit worse. There's, we haven't seen in history any technological leap that's going to allow a smaller sensor to be better than a bigger sensor because they're limited by physics, how much photons they can actually gather. And the differences are only one-tenth of a stop. But you could easily go out and buy a lens that gathered one stop more light. That's switching from an f5.6 lens to an f4 lens. That gathers twice the amount of light, one full stop. That gives you a big leap. So the difference is here. Should you necessarily upgrade your camera because of minute differences that you see or that you perceive? Probably not. In fact, almost all cam camera manufacturers seem to have very similar technology. So let's explore that some more. Do manufacturers have different technologies? This rates the sensors produced by different manufacturers since, again, the beginning of digital camera history. If you look at Sony, they came in a little bit late, but you see a definite arc. You also see that arc kind of flattening as we go on. It's interesting, if you go all the way back to the beginning, Canon was actually way ahead of Nikon. You can see they have higher scores back from 2004 all the way up to about 2008, 2009. And at that point, Nikon kind of surpassed them. Sony surpassed Canon just recently, just in the last couple of years, if you look at the trending lines. But then we can see in more recent history that Canon has really fallen behind and they've fallen into fourth place as far as sensor efficiency goes, factoring out the sensor size. But I do want to point out one particular outlier here, and you almost can't see it. But on the very right here, this gray dot right up there, that is hiding the 7D Mark II. <laughs> the 7D Mark II is hiding behind that, and you can see that newest Canon camera really jumps up and puts it right where uh, Sony and Nikon and Panasonic are. So that's why I say that Canon has made a bit of a leap with the 7D Mark II, not leaping ahead, but catching up with their competitors finally. So now that we have this data, let's ask how fast is sensor technology improving? You might be familiar with Moore's Law, which basically states that computing performance doubles every couple of years. And that has not kept up in recent years. Um, but we can make something like that for sensors by looking at this data. We can say that ISO performance of sensors improves by about half a stop every five years. But you'll notice if you look back at this chart that the arc isn't as steep as it was back in the early 2000s. It's leveling off. So that's why I say sensor technology improves by half a stop every five years, but it's also slowing down. They're leveling off a little bit, probably being limited by the just physics, because you have to physically gather these photons, and there's only so much efficiency you can possibly squeeze out of it. So I bring this up because a lot of people say uh, their new camera is two stops better than the previous generation of camera. I see that in forums all the time. It's always two stops or one full stop, and I call BS. Over time, it takes five years just to improve by half a stop. Let's play uh, another clip from Joe. If you need low light capability, get full frame. But if not, there's no sense of going to it. So that's a good question. Is full frame only good for low light? And first I want to point out, part of it is lens availability. There simply is no truly equivalent version of the 70-200 f2.8 for an APS-C or micro four-thirds sensor. 
Now, for example, Sigma has the 50 to 150 f2.8 lens, and that's something I recommend a lot for APS-C sensors, but it's not equivalent because they, it, it's only equivalent if you multiply the, fo the crop factor by the focal length, but you forget to multiply it by the aperture. So you're not gathering the same total amount of light. That means your images are going to end up noisier, and also you're not getting the same background blur, which is important for things that you use that, that lens for, like portraits. Optimal image quality is the amount of noise that you get at the camera's base ISO. This is producing the cleanest possible images. And optimal image quality is important for many different types of photography. Landscapes, portraits, studio work, especially night photography where you're working on a tripod and you get that opportunity to work at the base ISO. You don't care about optimal image quality if you're working in low light off of a tripod, if you're shooting sports or wildlife, because you're going to be working at the higher ISOs anyway. The factors are the maximum amount of light that a camera can possibly gather, which relates to its sensor size and its base ISO, but also the sensor efficiency, how good the sensor technology actually is. And I made this chart for another video, but I'll just review it really quickly. Over on the left there, we see the Nikon D810. It has better optimal noise than any other camera in this particular comparison. Below that, uh, you can see the A7S, which happens to take DxO marks ISO scores, it, it, it won that, it has the best ISO score of any other camera, but it doesn't do as well as the D810 because the D810 can shoot at ISO 64. The A7S is limited to ISO 100. So these are color coded to show that the full frame cameras are in green. And you can see every full frame camera has better optimal noise levels than every camera with a smaller sensor. That's because smaller sensor cameras tend to have the same base ISO of ISO 100. So when you're getting the cleanest possible images and you're shooting at ISO 100, you're gathering more total light with a full frame sensor. Therefore, you end up getting cleaner images according to DxO mark. Over on the right here, we have smaller sensors like micro four thirds sensors. They're also limited by the fact that they don't have an ISO 100 base ISO. The Panasonic cameras tend to have an ISO 160 base ISO, which gathers less light than ISO 100 and the Olympus cameras tend to have a base ISO of ISO 200. So they're gathering half the light, even per square millimeter. And as you can see, the quite pricey EM1 is uh, about 700% worse than the DA10, showing about seven times more noise. For more information, watch my original video at stp.io slash optimal. So I do recommend using smaller sensors for things like wildlife, video, and travel with wildlife you're probably cropping anyway, and so that extra pixel density will help you get the most out of your lenses. For video, you tend to be using high f-stops anyway, so the smaller size benefits you, and you don't actually need uh, to be working with the base ISO most of the time. For travel, where size is more important than image quality, the smaller sensors can just make the entire camera smaller and thus easier to carry. I do recommend using bigger sensors for lenses with more total light. Like if you actually need to use that 70 to 200 f2.8 for in the way that it was designed to get all the sharpness, all the background blur out of it, you're gonna need a full frame sensor because there is no equivalent. I also recommend using sensors for uh, situations where you require better optimal image quality. If you're happy with ISO 100 on your APS-C camera, more power to you. If you're doing commercial work or making large prints, I always end up going in and removing noise even at ISO 100, especially say in a blue sky, there'll be a ton of annoying noise when you get really nitpicky about it. If you're that nitpicky, full frame cameras will definitely improve conditions, improve noise in optimal conditions when you can work at the base ISO. One more clip from Joe. Okay, the other thing was that he said the aperture changes when going from a full frame to a crop sensor. That's absolutely not true. As long as this lens to the sensor distance changes, or this hole changes, the aperture remains absolutely the same. Yes, as I said earlier, crop factor is an abstract concept used for comparing lenses to understand equivalent results. It does not physically change any trait of the lens. Obviously, a mathematical concept can't physically deform <laughs> a lens in some way. Thank goodness, right? But the concept of crop factor exists so that we can easily compare how a lens will perform on a different size sensor. So here are two pictures, one taken with a full frame camera and the other taken with a micro four thirds camera, both at f2.8 at the equivalent focal length. And if you look at the picture on the left, look at the window in the background and how much more blurred it is than on the picture on the right. 
On the right, with the Micro Four Thirds sensor, it's much sharper. There's much less background blur. So they're both f2.8, but what is that f2.8 telling us? It's not telling us how much background blur we're going to get. The ISOs are the same here, but we established earlier that ISO 800 on a Micro Four Thirds sensor is going to give you far more noise than ISO 800 on a full frame sensor. Let's make these equivalent. Let's apply that crop factor to the aperture of the lens. Now, we had to bring the full frame camera up to f5.6 because with a crop factor of 2, 2 times 2.8 equals f5.6. So now we see precisely the same depth of field. The, the window in the background is exactly as blurred in both pictures. So now they're equivalent. But the ISO had to change on the full frame camera because we're using a smaller aperture, a higher f-stop number. So now that the full frame camera is at ISO 3200 and the Micro Four Thirds camera is at ISO 800, they're gathering the same amount of total light. And thus, given similar sensor technologies, they'll have about the same total image noise. So simply by applying the crop factor to the aperture, everything falls into place. Suddenly we get the same pictures, not just the same depth of field, but also the same total light gathered and the same total image noise. I want to reiterate, f-stop tells you nothing, absolutely nothing useful about the final picture that you're going to get with a lens unless you also factor in the sensor size. This is really important because manufacturers kind of exploit people's misunderstandings about how f-stop works. You know what it's like um, for a while there food manufacturers were telling you that you were only going to get a hundred calories in some particular product but then they wouldn't tell you what the serving size was. It was always 100 calories per serving. But then you'd look at the back and you'd find out like a set of Twinkies was two servings. And like whoever eats only one Twinkie, right? So they kind of used this extra factor to scam people. By not making it obvious what the serving size was, they allowed you to assume that the serving size was much bigger than it was. Food manufacturers made their product seem superior by using consumers ignorance of the underlying math of serving sizes, they tricked a lot of people. And camera manufacturers are doing that now with f-stops. Here's a good example of this. This is the Olympus Stylus One. It, you can see in their marketing copy here, a screenshot of it, they brag that it's a 28 to 300 millimeter f2.8. And they show a shadow of what a 300 millimeter f2.8 full frame lens would look like. And then they show their tiny little camera they're definitely implying that you'll get the same results. But the physical lens here is a 6 to 64 millimeter f2.8 lens. Uh, so it is actually an f2.8 lens. And they do tell you it's f2.8, but then they apply the crop factor to the focal length and they associate those two things. But they're inseparable. You cannot apply the crop factor to the focal length and not apply it to the aperture or you're overstating the capabilities of a lens and misleading consumers who are spending possibly thousands of dollars on your equipment. It's unethical and unfair, and it leads to disappointed people who don't get the results that they thought they were going to get, and perhaps don't fall in love with photography like the rest of us have. If you were to put this in equivalent terms, the lens itself would behave like a 28 to 300 millimeter f13 lens would on a full frame body. Again, that's total image noise in any given lighting situation, and depth of field. Basically, every factor that would impact your picture. Another good example of this is the Panasonic FZ200, which right on the barrel there, you can see it says 25 to 600 millimeter f2.8. In reality, it's a 25 to 600 millimeter f16, or at least it compares to that. No part of this behaves like a 600 millimeter f2.8 lens. To gather that amount of light would require massive amounts of optics. There's simply no way around needing a massive front element to gather f2.8 style light at 600 millimeters. And again, it's very misleading to apply the crop factor to the focal length, but not the aperture. Let's play another clip from Joe. You put this lens on a camera and you shoot your subject, okay? Say it's full frame, you shoot, okay? you're getting this in your frame, okay? Everything's looking good. Let's we'll say you get a crop sensor body, put the same lens on, and shoot. Now you're only getting about this in your uh, frame. So you have to back up to get recrop 
get the person back in perspective at the same as it was on the full frame. You have to back up four or five feet. Now, what this means is you backed away from your subject. That backing up motion is what changes the depth of field and the amount of background blur you get behind the subject. So going from full frame to a crop sensor camera is not what changes your background blur. If you stand in the same spot and focus on the same uh, subject at the same distance, you will always have the same amount of blur. That is what changes background blur is the backing up motion, having to get away back away from your subject. Joe brings up an interesting point, and it's one that I never touched on. I never decided to address using the same lens on uh, a different body with a different size sensor. I always kept the equivalent focal length the same. If you decide to use, say, a 100 millimeter lens on your full frame body and then switch to an APS-C body or a micro four thirds body, several things about the picture change uh, your subject distance. So you'd have to actually take steps farther back, but it's not like people who use smaller sensors are always standing really far away from their subject. We don't see that because they tend to just use lenses that uh, have similar equivalent focal lengths. So instead of using a 24 millimeter lens, they use a 12 millimeter lens with a 2x crop factor. Um, other things that would change are the compression and the background. But I did want to cover Joe's point because it is interesting and it's something other people brought up too. So let's look at an example here. This is a 55 millimeter lens on both a full frame and an APS-C body that's 1.5x a Sony. And you can see the subject size is the same, but the background has changed pretty drastically. You see the, there's a picture of a locomotive behind her. And you can see on the picture on the left, it's actually much smaller. So what we got is a very different picture by using the same lens on different bodies. And that's why I didn't consider it that interesting to compare the performance of a single focal length on different bodies. I assumed you would zoom. I also had to, of course, move my feet and back up some when I used a smaller sensor. Comparing the same focal length on uh, full frame and APS-C at 200 millimeters, we can see on the left, the full frame body, it is actually blurred a little bit more. But on the right, we're looking at an equivalent 300 millimeters, so there's less background. <laughs> there's a little bit more compression. Now, on the right here, instead of being 200 millimeters and f2.8, it would be basically 300 millimeters and f4. I don't know. It is, in other words, you can still use the crop factor and apply it to both the focal length and the aperture to exactly predict how a given lens, a full frame lens, will prefer, perform on a body with a smaller sensor. Let's play one more clip from Joe. So did you put full frame uh, uh, lens on your camera? Well, yes, but you got to watch out. Some of your older lenses were made for full frames always, uh, but they're older. Some of your newer lenses handle it better. You know, it, you, you're getting a crop sensor camera isn't that it has less detail. It's that it's pushing harder on the lens to try to get more information out, and the lens is not able to deliver that because it's older design or is designed for full frame. But I do uh, also recommend you go to DXL Mark and double check the lens because some full frame lenses might perform great on a full frame camera, but due to the pixel density, they're not able to uh, offer as good of a quality as you know, some modern crop sensor lens that have been designed for crop sensor. I totally agree with Joe, and in fact, I have a whole video about this. You can check it out at sdp.io slash glass first. Indeed, when we put full frame lenses on APS-C bodies, we end up seeing a significantly reduced sharpness, and you're almost always better choosing a lens designed for your sensor mount. But go ahead and check it out. There's more information there. A couple of things I wanted to address that other people have asked that Joe did not specifically ask uh, are crop cameras lighter? This kind of comes up all the time, and there's also some misinformation there based on people's misunderstanding of how they should apply the crop factor to the aperture. Let's look at some actual equivalent lenses. This is something manufacturers have been doing lately because they want you to be able to get full frame results with your APS-C bodies, and I absolutely love that they're doing this. Uh, one of my favorite lenses in the Fuji lineup is the 56mm f1.2. It's very similar to the full frame 85mm f1.8 lenses. Not everybody understands it though, they think it's faster because it's f1.2. So question, is it 
cheaper and lighter because those are kind of the big selling points of some of these smaller formats. And it's actually substantially more expensive than the Canon or Nikon equivalents. Um, it's also not any lighter. It's lighter than the Canon, but heavier than the Nikon. So when we look at equivalent lenses, lenses that actually perform the same, we don't necessarily see price or weight improvements. Olympus also has a 35 to 100 f2 lens. And of course, in equivalent terms, that becomes a 70 to 200 f4 lens. Canon and Nikon have those, so we can compare these. You're going to be getting the exact same images with the, these three lenses when you put native mount bodies on them. But the prices are very different. In fact, the Olympus camera over there costs almost twice as much as the Canon or Nikon version. Uh, for some reason, it's also much heavier. So here we see it working a little bit backwards. Now the Olympus lens is very durable and weather sealed and who knows, maybe it's even sharper. I haven't looked at the sharpness information, but it's also more expensive and heavier. So it doesn't seem like we're getting those improvements from working with the smaller format. Another good example is the Olympus 40 to 150 f2.8, which is equivalent to these zooms. You can see it costs almost three times as much and it's slightly heavier than the Canon and Nikon equivalent. Let's look at entire combinations of bodies and lenses. Let's take the Olympus EM1 and their 12 to 35 f2.8 lens, which we own and use and like a lot. Together, they cost about $2,100. They weigh just shy of two pounds. And according to DxO Mark, you'll get about nine perceptual megapixels of data in your images. For uh, about the same price, you can get a Nikon D610 with their 24 to 85 f4.5. It weighs twice as much. So you're looking around a lot more there. Here, the size benefits are definitely paying off with the EM1, even though it's not less expensive. However, you're getting 30% more detail out of the combination on the D610. You're gathering one stop more light, meaning in any given condition, you'll have cleaner images. We're talking about total light here. You'll have a wider zoom range. And when you get to shoot at the base ISO, when there's plenty of light, you'll have about three stops better image quality or about eight times less noise when you're shooting in a studio or in bright light. Another comparison, the EM1 with the 30 to 35 to 100 f2, which is like the 70 to 200 f4. Costs, uh, we'll compare this to the D610 again. The EM1 costs substantially more here because of the cost of the lens. Here, the weight is almost the same, 4.4 pounds versus 4.8 pounds of the Nikon setup with the mirror and the larger sensor. But the D610 also gathers substantially more detail at 20 perceptual megapixels. I don't have the number for how much detail the EM1 can get. The DX, uh, DxO Mark has not published it, but it only has a 16 megapixel sensor, so it's something south of that. Under optimal conditions, again, the D610 would produce images that were about three stops cleaner with about one eighth the noise of the EM1. So ask the question can you get the same results with smaller sensors? In theory, you can if you give them the same total light. Uh, but in practice, no, it doesn't really work out that way because of some choices that the manufacturers have made. Can you get good enough results? Certainly. And in fact, we use micro four thirds cameras all the time. All the cameras that are filming right, me right now are micro four thirds cameras. But I used the mathematical formulas I presented here to make educated choices. I bought lenses that gave me the exact performance that I need. We switched from full frame cameras to micro four thirds cameras, and I'm using mostly fast primes to get similar results. Is there a weight benefit to going with smaller sensors? Um, yes, if you're using shorter lenses with higher relative f-stops, um, just as you would get a smaller lens if uh, it was an f8 full frame lens, they don't actually make those. Uh, so again, if you're want smaller sizes, you will definitely find smaller and lighter cameras and lenses with smaller sensors, especially in the mirrorless world. But not when you attach bigger lenses, telephoto lenses, all the differences seem to disappear. And I just want to say, of course, it's the photographer that matters more. <laughs> because somebody always comes in and says, oh, gear doesn't matter. It's all about your effort and the time you put into it. Absolutely. And in fact, I wrote a whole book on photographic technique. I totally believe this philosophy. But some of us are interested in how things work. We're tinkerers. We like to understand them. Some of us are also spending thousands of dollars on gear, and we need to be able to predict the results that we're going to get before we actually buy that gear. 
we're planning and we need to know exactly how much background blur we're going to get, how far we're going to have to stand from the subject, how much noise there's going to be, and thus how much time we spend in post-processing cleaning up noise. So it does matter, but it's also interesting. I want to say thanks to Joe. I took some of his clips and didn't present the entire video, and I don't want to take anything out of context, so please do visit stp.io slash rant to see Joe's entire response. And if you want to come back to me and uh, make a correction, tell me I'm wrong about something, come back with a process that I can use to prove you right, or make a video of your own proving yourself right with actual photos. That's one thing nobody has done. Lots of people have told me that I'm wrong. Nobody has presented any shred of evidence or even told me how I can test it. If you present a process that I can use that will prove that it's better to describe lenses by applying the crop factor to the focal length but not the aperture, then I will retract everything. But all the data that I've looked at from objective sources like DxOMark, all the experiments that I've performed tell me that applying the crop factor to the focal length and the aperture shows me exactly how to get comparable images from smaller sensors. If you're interested in more technical details, check out my photography buying guide. I do cover crop factor and sensor size as well as many other technical aspects of photography and make specific recommendations for things like cameras, lenses, and flashes. It can save you thousands of dollars. The ebook is less than 10 bucks. You can get it at sdp.io slash store. I also have a Lightroom book. Very popular, comes with 12 hours of video, so you don't actually have to read the book. You can just work through the video and uh, download more than 100 presets. Again, you can check it out there or just go to Amazon. Thanks so much. Please do share this video. And when you see manufacturers using crop factor uh, deceptively by applying it to the crop factor but not the aperture, please say something in the comments. Please try to educate fellow consumers. You can save them thousands of dollars and a lot of misery. If you want to see more great videos, subscribe. Thanks.